Okay, thanks. Um, thanks to Amazon and thanks to everybody who's participating today and watching this in the future. So we just wanted to take um, as an opportunity to talk about how franchising works. Um, do we move the... Okay, yeah, let's move those. <laughs> So we're going to go through some legal considerations today. And, you know, we wouldn't be good lawyers if we didn't put a disclaimer on our first slide. So really everything we're doing today is, is general. We're talking to you at a high level. Feel free to reach out specifically if you have um, a specific legal issue, because it may be that the facts of your particular concern or question are different than what we're talking about in generalities today. So this is just for learning purposes. So I want to take a second here just to introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Sukhdeep and uh, this is my partner, Amy. We're the franchise law group here at KMB Law, a business-based uh, law firm in Mississauga and Burlington. We do everything a business owner client needs uh, from commercial litigation to franchise law, employment, commercial real estate, uh, to estate planning, anything a business owner client would need. So we would be able to service those types of clients. And today, our focus is on, like Amy mentioned, how to become a franchise owner. So, so let's just skip. Uh, so the agenda today, what we covering is we'll be covering the basics of franchising. What is franchising from a very high level perspective? What is the Arthur Wishard Act? What comprises the franchise disclosure package that a franchise is required to prepare before they sell franchises? What are the different structures of franchising? Of uh, how do you sell franchises to prospective candidates? What can you expect in terms of the legal process of franchising when you have an interested candidate that wants to purchase a franchise of your brand? How do you go through that? How do you navigate the legal process? Lastly, we'll be doing a bit of an overview of the crucial and key agreements that are involved in franchising that govern your relationship as a franchisor with your franchisees. So to begin, we'll be covering the basics. Okay, so the basics. So what is franchising? So franchising essentially is one type of business model. There's the owner-operator business model where you know you run an independent shop that you do not have any licenses or ties with any other third party that governs or controls your relationship, your operations, your IP, and your trademarks. So franchising essentially, they call it in the in the industry, is a business in a box model. So somebody has already taken the legwork and set up a, a, a business that's gone through the, the, the tough part of establishing the brand, the reputation, the system, the processes in place. They have a proven concept, and now they're looking for individuals that are able to follow rules, follow certain standards, and replicate the success they have through the franchise or training and systems and processes. So this is slightly different than like what I mentioned initially, your independent owner operator, which is more could be defined as an entrepreneur. So an entrepreneur is someone that likes to do things their way, establish their own systems and processes for their business. So that candidate may not likely be the most favorable candidate in franchising. Franchising is someone who follows the systems, processes, and rules that have been developed by a franchise system, developed by a franchise brand, and you are replicating the success of other franchisees and using that brand and that strength in the market to elevate your own success through a franchise ownership. So like I said, it's a form of business investment governing the sale and distribution of goods and services. So there are certain provinces in Canada that have legislated franchise uh, uh, statutes. What this means is franchise law in, in the six provinces, in Ontario is one of those provinces, has uh, an act. It's called the Arthur Bush Act. So this is a very consumer protection friendly act where it's just to protect prospective investors. So what the, what the legislators saw from, from 50, 60, 70 years ago in Canada was that a lot of people were putting their hard-earned money into business projects, into ventures, 
and a lot of those businesses were failing. And when they they dug down and did the due diligence, it was because there was a lack of disclosure provided from the franchisor in order to allow the franchisee to make a well-informed decision. So uh, these acts had to be mandated in these certain provinces that thought that governing this area where somebody is trusting someone else's business, business system and processes, there must be a minimum threshold, minimum standard that a franchise brand must meet before they bring their concept to market. So this, this essentially brought a level playing field of all franchise brands that are entering these legislative provinces where would-be investors are interested in buying a franchise. They must all comply with the rules and the regulations under the Arthur Busher Act. And like I said, the application of the Arthur Busher Act, we'll, we'll get into in the next couple of slides, but franchising, like I mentioned, is different from licensing. And we get a lot of inquiries, a lot of people ask, what is the difference between a franchise and a license? A license essentially entails a brand that has IP, that has trademarks, has license to a third party, the right for them to use that brand and that trademarks. As soon as the concept and element of control comes into play, this now borderlines franchising. And the way courts have historically and traditionally treated this, uh, if we take Ontario for an example, if it looks like a franchise, smells like a franchise, the law will treat it like a franchise. So we can call it ABC agreement, a license agreement, but if that agreement has essential components of what the franchise law dictates that a franchise is, then it will be treated as a franchise. So if it's treated like a franchise, that investment must be uh, uh, but go through the Arthur Richard Act and the franchise disclosure obligations. So all of a sudden, there are now thresholds in place when you when a brand wants to dictate certain control elements of saying this is this is the the the, the color of of tiling you must have. This is the type of product you must sell. You must sell it at this price. When those types of control elements come into the relationship between party A and party B, you are now getting into the franchising realm and the franchising realm has certain rules and regulations in those six governed provinces that a franchise board must follow. There are differences in Quebec. Quebec is follows the civil code. So, uh, you know, if we get a lot of queries that's saying, how does franchising work there? Again, like I said, six of the provinces are governed by franchise legislation, and Quebec is not one of them as this state. In, in Ontario, BC, Alberta, Manitoba, and the two maritime provinces that have franchise legislation, this is a slightly different than the United States. So the United States has almost 32 states out of the 52 that have franchise specific legislation. So uh, on top of a franchise or complying and having their franchise disclosure package ready, they must also register with the state. This is the only difference in Canada in regards to registration. There's no requirement for a franchise brand to be registered with a government entity in Canada at this time. So long as if they're operating in a franchise specific province that has legislated franchise legislation, they must have a franchise disclosure package that is in compliance with the laws of that province. So at this time, there is no registration requirement. So there is a difference between Canadian franchise law and U.S. franchise law, at least from a high level perspective. Okay, <laughs> so you've heard a little bit about franchising in the Arthur Richard Act. Um, and we've certainly mentioned the franchise disclosure document. So I'm going to get into that in a little bit more detail. So one of the big things that the Arthur Wishard Act, being a protection, uh, protectionist piece of legislation does, is it says, look, you need to have some basic information to fulfill the obligations of disclosure. Very similar to securities disclosure. Um, and so it ends up being a package a couple inches thick that has a bunch of information um, really that starts with information about the background of the brand. So what have they done in the past? Do they work with other brands, similar or, or dissimilar? Do they, um, you know, have they gone through lawsuits or administrative issues? What, who are the people behind the brand? And that's really important because the people certify the disclosure package, and I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, so you list your directors and officers and their background, you know, a little bit of a bio. 
And some of this is really helpful from a sales perspective, but you know, it's important to understand it has to be accurate and, and, and complete because it is also not only a sales tool, but it's a requirement legislatively. So, um, so again, you'll have information about the background of the brand and the people behind it. You'll have information about cost, and this is a really big one. So you're going to have to have very, very clear information about what it will cost to buy this franchise. What will it cost to build it out? Is there a brick and mortar store? Is it a home-based business? What are the costs of the office space, of the retail space, if it's retail? Um, you know, hiring and uh, will you need employees right away? Will you need working capital right away? Uh, what will your rent cost be? What type of location? What size are we talking about? Are we talking about a thousand square feet with a, you know, a, um, a, a, a client facing or is it more of a warehouse type of space? Is it more, is it, is it quite large and small? So all of those details um, specifically related back to cost will be in the middle of the FDD. And that's very, very important. There's tons of case law about how important it is for that uh, information to be very accurate. And often our brand new franchisors struggle with that part uh, because, you know, maybe 10 years ago, they started their first restaurant. They're now ready for franchising. Um, you know, you, that, that particular example, that franchisor potentially would have no idea how much it costs to build out a store in today's market. So there is some research that has to be done. There are consultants, there are, you know, people who uh, help with the build outs, you know, the construction teams who can help kind of compile that information. But um, that typically is one of the things that can take some time uh, to make sure that you're capturing everything that's required at the startup for those, those brands. So we've got information about the background, we've got information about the finance and the and the, uh, the cost, and then you're going to include financial statements of the franchisor, and, and there are some variations on what level of, of financials are required, and I, you know, I'll leave the, those details to be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis, but you'll include financials, and then you'll include a copy of any other agreement you're going to require them to sign, anything that's going to be signed. So of course, there's going to be a franchise agreement. And we will get into the details of these documents uh, in, in a couple of slides. Um, everybody would be aware of the franchise agreement. Sometimes they're called license agreements, but as Vicki mentioned, it, it's irrelevant what we call it. If it is a franchise, it is a franchise. So you have the, your, your key operations agreement, typically referred to as a franchise agreement. And then you'll have a, a number of little documents, little agreements that may or may not be relevant to all brands. And again, we'll talk about those in a second. So that's the bulk of the disclosure package. Information about the brand and the background, information about what you need to get into it cost-wise and, and obligations, and then there are copies of all the agreements, and then there are some paraphrasing of those agreements, so some high-level you know, things that are going to have to be pointed out, um, high-level obligations of the franchise B. Um, and so that's that package. Not only is it very, very specific about what it has to have in it, but it also has a catch-all called a material fact. You have to provide all material facts. And so that's why when you put these things together, they aren't really a fill in the blank type of form. They do require a conversation with your legal team to make sure that what you are capturing or thinking of as a material fact is, is everything. For example, if you, you know, a material fact might be that you're in the process of selling the brand to another owner, the franchisor may be changing. Um, it could be specific to the brand, you know, license obligations uh, that surround the industry of this franchise business are going to change. They're going to need a more onerous license, or maybe they won't need a license within a period of time. That's all material to the decision to go into that level of business. Um, you know, it could be specific about the actual franchisee in that unit, you know. Uh, maybe this is a model that typically is inside um, large malls, and this specific one that we're talking about is going to be very different. It's going to be in a hospital or in an airport, so different than the typical model. That would be a, a material fact to point out, that this is the first time we've done it in this province or in this way. Um, so there's the concept of material fact is very, very broad, intentionally broad under the legislation. And so it's really important to fully understand what your business is intending, what the franchisee prospect expects, and what would be material to the franchisee prospect's uh, decision. So that's um, a very high level kind of explanation of what needs to make up the FDD, the franchise disclosure document. The legislation has a bunch of, you know, a bunch more rules, although it is quite a short act. It does have a bunch of rules uh, not, uh, about not only what needs to be in the FPD, but how it, needs, how it must be provided and for how long. 
So you must send it out all in one package. It can't be a number of attachments. You know, sometimes we see franchisors who are unsophisticated or aren't working with proper franchise counsel who send out um, the FDD and the attached agreements and some bio information and financial statements all in different attachments or different emails. It's not allowed. It has to be in one document, one PDF. Typically, it's provided either by uh, PDF attachment or directly by DocuSign. Uh, Adobe sign. So there are lots of ways to do that. And in the old days, they had to be printed off and bound. There were, there's always been rules about delivery. Uh, timing, you have to have that document in the prospect's hands for no less than 14 days. The way that we do that is the day that you provide the FBD is day zero, the next full day is day one, 14 days, and the following day being you know technically 15, 16, depending on how you're counting. Uh, is the first day you can sign those documents up. And so that's really important. Those 14 days, they cannot pay you anything. Um, I'm putting a star beside that, which I'll come back to. They cannot pay you anything and they cannot sign any agreements until that 14-day period is complete. That 14-day period is more than likely going to be longer than 14 days. It cannot be shorter. Okay, so that is the period of time where the, the prospect would review the documents, would ask you questions, would talk to their own legal counsel, and would send you any comments or discussion points that they would have. Uh, negotiations are very typical in today's day, uh, you know, in today's world for franchising. I think if you were to talk to franchise lawyers 10 years ago, that would be a different discussion. But today, most brands are open to some level of discussion. Uh, many, many, you know, many brands are, are not, um, but those typically uh, are the A++ brands, the ones where there is a lineup of people waiting to, to buy the franchisee um, unit. And so the reason I put a star and asterisk beside the concept of paying is because um, about three years ago, the law changed and you can now take a deposit uh, before the disclosure document or the disclosure period is complete. So there is some way to have kind of that skin in the game now with prospect franchisees. It has to be it's still very detailed. It can only be 20% of the total amount that you'd be taking from the franchisee. So if your initial franchise fee is $20,000, you're not taking a ton for your deposit. Um, and it has to be completely refundable. So that means, you know, if the 14 days then end and they decide they don't want to go ahead with it, they can get their money back in, in full. So it's really important to understand that because uh, those two items, the, the small amount of the deposit that can be taken uh, attached to the requirement to keep it completely refundable does make that deposit concept difficult to use. So many brands decide not to take a deposit and just wait for the 14 days. Um, so that's the, you know, the, the high level disclosure concept. Under the act, there are a couple of other things that we just wanted to touch on. Um, rescission. So that word is something that keeps franchisors up at night. What that is, is it's, a, uh, it's written into the legislation, it's created by the Act, and it's a, a recovery mechanism for franchisees who did not get proper disclosure. So they can have a 60-day rescission, which is pretty useless, or a two-year rescission, which is very useful for a franchisee who gets into business with a franchise system that is not ready or not capable of uh, success. And so if the franchise disclosure was non-compliant, so pieces of it were missed or the timing was not um, made compliant, the delivery mechanism was not compliant, any of those things that I've just talked through were not done properly, you uh, as a prospect franchisee or your prospect franchisee could have a period of up to two years to say, had I gotten proper disclosure, even if it's irrelevant. They don't have to prove that the proper disclosure would have changed their mind. All they have to do is prove that you gave them non-compliant or improper disclosure. If that is, is, and that's very typically black and white, you can tell. If that isn't the case, they can claim back every dollar they've put into that business up to the date of rescission. So if they've been working on the business for 18 months and they've you know, spent 500,000 building out the business and they put another five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars into the business over that period of a year and a half. All of that would be part of the rescission claim against the franchisor and the franchisor individuals who signed the improper disclosure package. So there is personal liability attached to that. So that's really the thing that keeps franchisors up at night is disclosures and rescission. It's really important that, uh, that you do your disclosure work and you create your franchise disclosure document with somebody, you know, a lawyer who understands franchising. Okay, 
couple of other quick things that the app does is it creates a duty of good faith and fair dealing, which is really important. It's a dual duty. Both you and the franchisee owe each other that duty under the act. Um, and that just means you can't use you know, the letter of the um, agreement to kind of push them around. You have to always consider the franchisees in your um, in your process and your decision making. So you don't have to make the best decision for them um, at the you know detriment of yourself. That's not a requirement, but you do have to consider the franchisees. And so if you were doing something that uh, was, you know, not beneficial to you, but certainly was harmful to your franchisees, you could be, um, you know, you could be in breach of this duty. And the last thing, just very quickly, is the, the um, Arthur Richard Act and, and the other franchise legislation creates the right for your franchisees to associate. You can't prevent them from talking to each other. And in fact, one of the things that is in your franchise disclosure document is contact information of all your current and past franchisees so that your prospect franchisees are easily able to connect with them and ask them how it is to be in business with you. Uh, so the right to associate is also an important one. Okay, so uh, assuming you put together your franchise disclosure package, uh, how does a franchisor go from a single unit to 100 locations, 200 locations? So there are many different avenues of growth, um, and we're going to touch base upon the main ones. So you can grow as a franchisor through single unit franchising. This is very uh, the most common model. What this means is growing unit by unit. So uh, and you you have a franchise unit that's interested. You grant them rights to operate a single location of X Y Z brand. This could expand into multi-unit uh, uh, opportunities for a franchisee. If say, for example, in Brampton, I know the market well, and I'm the first one to bring that concept to Brampton as a franchisee, I may get asked for multi-units, uh, right? Saying I'll open three or four or five locations in a five year period, but please don't grant another French, uh, act, a franchisee uh, access to that market until I've satisfied my multi-unit or area development term. So you can get multi-unit rights and area development also is very similar to that is where an area has been car carved out for an individual that has shown that they are, they know that area or ge ge uh, geographic zone uh, uniquely. And because the franchisor may or may not have experience in growing in that market, they grant those area development rights to that individual to allow them to grow that brand potentially faster than a franchisor could grow that area single unit by single unit. So that's just a mechanism of accelerating the growth of, of, of franchising from a franchisor's perspective. So we've discussed single unit, the multi-unit approach, area development, and then master franchising. So master franchising, again, it's another concept of, of growth. Say my brand is regional to Ontario. I know the Ontario market very well here, but now I've seen in candidates interested in opening up locations in Alberta and BC. However, how do I as a franchisor, one, get my supply and goods and inventory over there? How do I support those franchisees in those provinces? How do I do conduct audits and inspections and training? So because unless a franchisor has those components and capabilities across the nation, they may want to consider master franchising. What that essentially means is a franchisor finds an individual or a group of individuals that knows a certain market, a city or province much better than the franchisor that may have access to those suppliers, to those vendors that the franchisor may not have access to in that area of that country or, or, or province. And that, that master franchisee essentially steps in the shoes of the franchisor in that province. So that master franchisee would be entitled to X amount of royalties from those franchisees. A certain percentage will come back to have the head franchisor. There would be a split between the royalty fees, franchise fees, marketing fund between that master franchisee and that candidate and the franchisor. So, but that master franchisee candidate would be responsible for finding candidates in that territory, for providing training, helping with site selection, construction, and build up. So essentially, it's it would become an affiliate of the franchisor operating in that province. But at the end of the day, they uh, there would be some type of fee compensation going back to the head franchisor for those master franchise rights. And something that to other consider when when looking at the growth aspect of it is franchisors tend to have a concept of in our franchise agreement, 
a franchisee finds a, a signs up, a, signs up a location, and then some usually they are permitted to go and find a location that's subject to the franchisor's approval. But we've seen in, in a lot more after the pandemic that franchisors have tried to get back that control because a lot of supply chain issues, uh, uh, you know, their franchise brands are growing in territories they traditionally do not have experience in. So what franchisors have, have started to do is provide more turnkey options to prospective franchisees. So what that means is a franchisor would either take on site selection on behalf of the franchisee, or going with the franchisee, find a location, and equip it, construct it, build it, and then just essentially turn over the keys to the franchisee saying, now you need to open for business. The alternative, like I discussed, was the franchisee would find a, a approved supplier, approved construction company, and the franchisor would over have the oversight and management of that construction. But in the other way of turnkey is the franchisor is responsible for everything. The franchisee pays the franchisor for whatever it may cost, and the franchisor delivers a ready-made business to that franchisee. What we've seen this accelerate is uh, the opening time, uh, training, uh, you know, supply chain, vendors and contractors, it just becomes much more smooth from a franchise worker perspective to deal with all of those things on behalf of franchisees rather than having franchisees, you know, delay uh, selection of approved suppliers, delay the selection of certain sites that the franchise may otherwise be, uh, you know, to, to work for that brand. So it just moves things along much faster. But having said that, there is more risk and liability for the franchisor. They uh, will have to, you know, initially be responsible for that construction. They will have to ensure that they deliver the ready-made turnkey location to that franchisee. So yes, the franchisor will have more responsibility and, and they will have to essentially uh, take on all of those responsibilities, which in other concepts franchisees may typically have to take on, but it allows uniformity, it allows uh, control, and allow the delivery of a more consistent and, and quality control product to the franchisee rather than having inconsistent build out, layout, uh, different types of uh, locations that might be traditional versus non traditional. So the franchise developer can control the process much more through delivering turnkey locations to franchisees. So, legal risks. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, most of our prospect franchisors, people who are considering franchising their systems, want to understand what it really will be like on a, on a kind of day to day. So this is the process for you have, you know, a lead that's turned into an operational franchisee. This is everybody's goal. Um, and, you know, we work with franchisors on a day to day basis, it's the thing with each of these steps or many of these steps anyhow. So. The interest shown, that can be done either organically, just somebody mentions to you at your store, hey, if you ever think about franchising this, I'd be interested in whatever city they're from. Um, it could be that you do a trade show. It could be that you're working with a broker to create leads. Whatever the process is, once there's interest shown, that's when you you know, you know you start that sales process to bring in the franchisor. I recommend really strongly that you have some level of application and even interview. Now, most often that is now a Zoom interview, but in person, uh, some form of meeting um, before you provide the FPD. Because once you provide the FPD, you're providing them with a whole bunch of information about you, your background, your financials, the cost. You know, that is a package of information that can be used to help somebody else create their own competitive brand. So you need to be really uh, careful about providing too many of those. Many of our newest franchisors do over provide FPDs. Uh, they provide five or six, they sign up one or two maybe. Uh, and so really you want to have a strong application and interview process to avoid sending out FPDs that are unnecessary or, or inappropriate. Once you've gotten past that application, you've seen what their finances are, you looked at their background, you think, yes, they can, they can operate this business. Yes, they can afford this business. Um, and they have the right fit, right feel for us. But you would now email your lawyers a list of what needs to be put into the FPD. So every detail, what city, you know, what city, what territory are they looking at? Are there details you've negotiated before the FPD is going out? Do we need to make any changes to the documents? Um, have we negotiated down any of the pricings? Um, <clears throat> do you have a specific location line? Is there actually a specific lease already? So all those details that may be uh, considered material facts or the specific one-off location. 
Let us know. You let us know the, the details of the franchisee prospect, and we put together an FDD that's either very generic or very specific, depending on the type of FDD we have. We would send that out, um, and that's done very, very specifically in a, pro, in a very clear process to make very, very clear down the road when it was provided for how long and in what form. So all of that is saved and kept um, very clearly. Then that 14 day period starts. And again, I say 14 day period, but in my experience, it often is much longer. Um, so during that period, once they have the FDD, they'll negotiate with counsel, as you mentioned. So they're going to look through it. They're going to read through it. They're going to have questions. Um, they may even say things like, hey, I was talking to your sales team and they said something different than what this document says. So you have to make sure that all the people that are involved with this process are, are on the same page or, or understand what they can and cannot say because any representations outside of what's in the FDD can be very dangerous for a franchisor. So you go through the process, the, the, um, the prospect themselves or their legal counsel may reach out and say, hey, you know, we'd really like it if you started taking the royalty four months after we start um, you know, running the business because for the first four months, it's going to be very expensive. We're not going to have any extra money laying around. So those types of conversations are very typical, will happen, and, and you will then say yes or no, you know, we're comfortable with that change or no, we can't make that change, we've been asked before, and we've always said no, whatever it is. And if you decide to make any changes based on <clears throat> this negotiation period, we'll put together what's called an addendum or an amending agreement, and you have to send that out very similarly to the FDD in a very specific manner, and what's called a material change statement or a statement of material change. Um, and so that both the FED and the Statement of Material Change are very um, specific under the Act, have rules about not only what's in them, but in the form that they are arrived in and for how long and whatnot. So all of that has to happen um, with help from legal counsel. Then, and this, you know, this happens in a number of ways now. It can be in person where you fly over to where or you drive to where the franchisor is located and, and the franchisor and the prospect franchisees all meet together and talk about what the brand is like and make sure there's buy-in and the right fit. Uh, sometimes that's done one-on-one -on -one by Zoom in a very similar way to that first interview. But really the idea is let's tell them a little bit more about what's behind the curtain. Let's give them a little bit more of the secret sauce so that they understand exactly what they're getting into. And very, very clearly, you're going to provide them with what they can expect from a day-to-day -day life as a franchisee. You know, are they going to be expected to be working seven until seven, nine to five, three to two, whatever it is? <laughs> Um, are they expected to be physically in the business every day for, for the bulk of the time? Are they uh, entitled to be passive in terms of their ownership and they can hire a manager? So all that stuff will be discussed. Um, all the questions they had from the provision of the FED will be discussed. And once we are on the same page with the franchisee, we decide we want them to proceed. They decide they want to proceed. We've negotiated and we're all happy with the contracts as they stand. We move on to execution. Um, and that also should be managed because there are some rules about it, but generally the answer is they're, they're signing up the documentation, the franchise agreement, the guarantee, and the other items we'll talk about in, one, in a minute. Um, and, uh, and, and, you're, and then you become the franchisee at execution. So they would also pay the initial franchise fee plus the HFT at that time. Uh, then typically, again, you know, so we mentioned how perhaps the location may already be determined, but the bulk of the franchise disclosures we do are not predetermined. Um, and in which case that means you are now a franchisee and you typically have a period, maybe it's 120 days, maybe it's 180 days to sign a lease. Um, and if you don't sign that lease, typically both you and the franchisor will have an exit, an exit right after that period of time. So you're looking for a lease, the franchisor needs to approve the lease, but typically the, the, the um, obligation to find a location is, is the franchisee's. So you will have a, a, a consent right no matter what uh, level of involvement the franchisee has. So once the location is determined, then the build-out starts, and that may be, again, um, that may be controlled more, more by you or by the franchisee. It really depends on what you want and what the franchisee wants, and then it becomes operational. And in, in there, in some way, will be significant training. Typically, that's happening while the build-out is happening, but of course, not every brand has the build-out, and then, you know, that may happen in a bit of a different time frame. But um, operational unit, day one, grand opening, uh, and, and then you have a franchisee and you start that process over with number two. <laughs> All right. So the last bit we're going to touch on is the, the key documents and agreements that you will be required to sign up with your franchisee. So 
Inside of the franchise disclosure packet, which Amy has discussed in detail, is the franchise agreement and all ancillary documents a franchisee will be forced to sign with the franchise owner. So the all important document here is the franchise agreement. So this is the agreement that governs the relationship between a franchise owner and a franchisee. So all terms and uh, in regards to the legality of the relationship can be found in the franchise agreement. If it was discussed between the sales team or head office and not made in writing, then it's almost as if those points do not exist. So if certain points were amended, they have to be either form or part of the franchise amending agreement that would be signed up consecutively with the franchise agreement or the, those points essentially do not exist. So the, the franchise agreement, just to give you a, an overview, you know, the, it talks about the grant of the franchise to the franchisee, any territory that the franchisee may have been granted, what's the franchise fees, what's the royalty fees, what are the advertising fund, what, uh, site, the site, site selection process, what happens in construction, who's responsible as the franchisor versus the franchisee. You move into a section usually about the IP and the trademarks, who they belong to, and what happens in the enforcement or the breach uh, uh, or violation of, of, of trademarks that belong to the franchisor. What are the franchisee's duties to protect the marks and the brand of the franchisor? all operational requirements from the franchise or whether or not a franchisee is required to spend full-time commitment on the on the business and, and all of the operational requirements what licenses so on and so forth they may be required to uh, obtain um, in regard and in addition to the advertising fund as to what the contribution will be from the franchisee's perspective to the franchise or uh, what happens on death, disability, what happens if the franchisee wants to sell the location uh, to a third party, all those points are found in the franchise agreement. There will be a, a section on termination, what happens on what are the events of, the, of default that a franchisee can find themselves into, and what happens on certain events of default. Are they curable? Are they non curable? What happens if a franchise or terminates the franchise agreement based on defaults of the franchisee? So all effects of termination, uh, any damages uh, potential that a franchisee uh, may suffer, and any uh, dispute resolution process, whether it's arbitration, mediation, that a franchise has in place, all of these mechanics are found within a franchise agreement. So I do see that uh, there are questions here. So I'm just gonna open that up. Sound has echo. Um, I have a question. If you... Sure. Yes. So, hi, my name is Shafi. I'm with a bank and I get clients or inquiries from franchise, potential franchisees. And we normally suggest to have a good law, law office or lawyer represent you and guide you and advise you through the process. So, what is the typical service in the industry, not for your firm specifically, but uh, what is the industry norm uh, from a law office, is there any free first half hour consultation? How much are the costs? So we can educate them also and also set the expectation that this is how yeah. the process dealing with the law office. And, and because then you go through all the things you're mentioning here, right? Like vetting their franchise agreement, what they're getting themselves into. Yeah, I think so what you're asking, asking uh, you're a little quiet, but I think what you're asking is just some information about costs, correct? Yes, also the voice in your room is echoing, so it kind of like spills over. So when I'm speaking, I like I hear it twice. Yeah, so so I'll talk about cost first. Um, the, the so generally prospect franchisors, people who are interested in franchising, will come in and talk through this. We'll have a phone call, a Zoom call, or an in-person meeting. We'll have a very similar conversation to what you've had today, maybe a little bit more two-sided. <laughs> Um, but you know, we'll talk through what the brand is. Have you trademarked anything? What what do you have established already? What do we need to establish? And if there's nothing established, the total cost can be as high as twenty five, thirty five thousand dollars. It can get out there. Uh, this is a significant process, um, but it really depends on how new the brand is, how much work needs to be done to get those details that we've talked about. You know, do we need to spend a lot of time with you? 
discussing cost and what the, you know, how this will start and, and what we need to do, or will you talk with a consultant or perhaps your own team to help us with some of that stuff? So it can range, you know, from putting together these documents for 10, 15, $20,000 all the way up to almost 40. Um, and, and again, you know, we may need to restructure the, the corporate structure, the ownership. We may need to incorporate companies and move assets around. We may need to um, protect the brand and trademark if we haven't done that. So there are a number of things that may or may not be needed. And so that's why we definitely recommend an initial consultation. This isn't something we can provide a quote for like buying, you know, a, a widget. We do need to talk through to make sure that we're both on the same page, what needs to happen and what doesn't. Um, and my advice is generally, you know, to, to start up franchisors to, you know, really like, I, I do think it can be very beneficial to have at least one location. I mean, technically you don't have to have a location at all to franchise a concept. You can have an idea that you want to franchise. And, you know, we have some brands that do, you know, franchise based on ideas. It is difficult. And I think most difficult from a sales perspective, it's very difficult to talk to somebody and say, yeah, we think this brand will really work, but we've never tried it. You know, that's a, a hard sell. Um, and so I think that it's very important for a franchisor to have some, um, you know, history with some proof of concept. Some proof of concept, exactly. I'm not sure if we got your entire question. Sorry, it was it was, it was quiet here. <laughs> okay, so I'll move on to the next piece. Um, is you'll find it, the table of contents of the operations manual if a franchisor has it at the time of the preparation of the disclosure packet and the provision of the FPD, that table of contents for the manual will have to be included in the FPD. Any types of general security agreement that a franchisor will take over the assets of the franchisee, that form of agreement will be provided in the disclosure package. Whether or not a franchisor requires a personal guarantee from the individuals and principals and owners behind the franchisee company, that also will be provided in a franchise agreement. So guarantees are pretty standard and market in franchising, very similar to loans, um, and, and, or leases where landlords require personal guarantees uh, or whether it's tenants or uh, borrowers is very similar in franchising as well. The franchise agreement will also uh, typically have uh, either the sublease or lease writer concept or, or, or both of them. So what this essentially means in, in a nutshell is the franchisor can determine whether or not it goes on the head leases of brick and mortar premises for franchisees and subleases that premises to their prospective franchisees. If, if they choose to, to go on the head lease, then obviously the franchisor is liable to the head landlord and they will call and the, and the sub landlord, which is the franchisor or their affiliate will be responsible for collecting rent from their franchisee. This, con this uh, avenue allows more control from the franchisor. It makes termination of franchisees easier. And franchisors may want AAA locations uh, uh, controlled by head office. In the event an operator is not sufficient and it's found out later once they offer their operational, uh, franchisors may want to control those AAA locations. The alternative is lease rider and a tri-party concept. So what essentially this means is the franchisee goes directly on the head lease with the head landlord, but a lease rider or a tri-party agreement is signed up between the landlord, the franchisor, and franchisee, which gives the franchisor the option, but not the obligation, to take over the lease in the event of default of the franchisee of any terms under the lease agreement or the franchise agreement. So it allows the franchisor to step in and take over that location if they want to, but doesn't give them an obligation. So if it's a new location in a new territory, franchisor may or may not be familiar with that territory. They may require a franchisee to go on it, but still have that lease rider option. And in, in, in other, other circumstances, it just may be their model is they do not take risks, they do not go ahead leases, but they require everyone to sign a lease and end a lease rider just so they have that control in the event of termination. They don't lose that location after to close it down and have another pizza shop open up where the burger where joint used to be. They can at least control the closure aspect of their brand and, and at least uh, have consistency uh, of that brand uh, and not have more closures with stiff on their FTD. So it's just a matter of control aspect and the franchisor has that flexibility in the franchise agreement to decide either sublease or at least starter concept or potentially both depending on the viability of the location, the size of the location and which jurisdiction or, ge or geographic region it's in. And lastly, all any types of supply agreements that a franchisee will be required to enter into with the franchisor must be filed within the franchise agreement and disclosure packet. 
So whether it's, it's an IP agreement, whether it's it's with any uh, external suppliers or vendors of the franchise, or then a franchisee will require to sign uh, as soon as they sign up a franchise agreement that exists as of that date. All of those agreements must be provided within the disclosure package, so a franchisee has a time and opportunity to review that with their legal counsel and know ahead of hand before they actually proceed in purchasing that franchise. So generally speaking, the, in, in, a, in a disclosure package is a franchise agreement and all ancillary agreements, and this, conform, this compiles and forms the FDD from a franchise board perspective. So now we'll open the floor up to any questions you guys may have. Our, in, our names, our emails, and our phone numbers are on the screen. Our website is, at the back, uh, is on the bottom as well. Feel free to reach out if you have any further questions. But we want to thank Emma at this time, you know, for giving us this opportunity for everyone taking the time in uh, this early morning and joining us on the franchising session. So if there are any questions or comments, please feel free. We'll, we'll be sticking around for about minutes. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate you guys uh, coming out and joining us today. Um, I know that um, some have unmuted themselves. You're more than welcome to do so as well. Um, again, we are recording uh, this event, so you can go back and look at it. It will be on our site in the coming days um, under the news section, and we'll have the video posted there. Um, so at this time, um, we'll take any questions. If anybody wants to unmute themselves, you're more than welcome to. Hi. Um, can I have a quick one, please? Of course, yes. Yep, thanks. I uh, just wanted to know the, the um, package documents you just mentioned. Um, so you sign only the franchise agreement and all the other agreements are part uh, of the franchise agreement as annexures, or do you have to sign the franchise agreement together with the other um, agreements as well? So, so the first, if you're the franchise B, the first thing you'll get is the entire franchise disclosure package. And that package, the only thing you sign is uh, what's called a receipt, um, promising it, telling the franchise where you've received it. So that's the first thing you sign is just indicating receipt of the package. It doesn't obligate you in any way. Then after the 14 days or however long that, that time frame takes, then you, when you're ready, then you sign the actual package document. So there you would sign the franchise agreement, you would sign the guarantee, you would sign uh, the general security agreement if there was one. And if there was already a lease in place, you would sign the sublease at that time as well. Uh, and then also any of those ancillary, I think we talked about the license agreement, the, you know, any type of, you know, for example, if you're buying a hair salon, you might have to sign a supply agreement with a certain brand. Um, and so those documents would all be signed at the execution time when you pay your initial franchise fee and you, uh, you know, you, you, you sign on the dotted line saying, okay, I am becoming a franchisee. Uh, all of those documents would be signed at that time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Um, and so when I was talking about cost, I'll just feel free to jump in with questions. But when you know there was a previous question about cost, and I also wanted to indicate that so that that initial cost I mentioned is really when we take franchisors that have, or prospect franchisors, people who are thinking about franchising, and take them from nothing to ready to go. Um, there is an ongoing cost to franchise work, and that is really in the disclosure. So typically, if you're working with a legal team, you'll also be um, you know, help, your legal team will be helping you send out those disclosures. So those are either sent out by your own team, somebody within your team that has a legal background who can do that in a very specific way, or you'll outsource that to legal counsel um, or potentially consultants. And so those disclosures, sending them out, putting together execution packages, filing security, you know, all that upkeep. And then on the, on the back end of that, the uh, default and compliance work. So if your franchisees aren't following the rules, if they haven't paid you, you know, if they're using your brand in a way that you're not comfortable with, any of those things, if they're not following the rules, then we also, uh, either internally or externally with legal help like us, you would, you know, deal with those things. And in my experience, especially with new franchisors, dealing with those things quickly and fairly is very important to, the, to building the health of that system because, um, you know, across the franchisees who think they are, they can do what they want within reason. Uh, you know, if they're not being told that they can't, they will continue to push that envelope to a point where your brand may not uh, be as tight as the franchise brand should be. Any other questions? 
Okay. All right. Well, awesome. Thank well, thank you very much to both of you for joining us. Um, and thank you to all our guests for attending. Uh, again, it will be on our site in the coming days. Um, wishing you all a very uh, successful day. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.